Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on SAP CAMP for ABAP developers. Uh, in the previous session, uh, we had uh, exposed the Northwind O data service and also the SAP S4 HANA O data service. Uh, but we were not able to read from the SAP S4 HANA O data service uh, because we had to provide the API key. Uh, so in this uh, session, uh, what we will do is we will look at the steps on how to create the custom logic and pass in the API key. Uh, so if you want the finished version of this step, uh, then you can go ahead and check out uh, version 3. Uh, the main steps uh, in this uh, step uh, is uh, uh, we are going to move the entity information into schema.cds file. Uh, this is uh, optional. Uh, what we want to do is uh, we just want to clean up some of the code. Uh, so I'm going to move the information into the schema.cds file. Uh, and then we are going to implement the custom read handler for S4 sales orders. Uh, so these are the main steps we want to accomplish. Uh, so in order to do this, in order to write custom custom logic, uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to create a file uh, with the same name. Uh, and this file is going to contain the JavaScript logic. And uh, we are going to name it uh, with the same name as the .cds file. And I'll show you how you can do this. Uh, this is going to be a manual process. And then this is where you're going to be writing the custom uh, JavaScript logic. Now, before we start writing uh, JavaScript logic, uh, we do need to understand the uh, concept of a middleware function. Now, a middleware function, uh, this is, uh, you can see this almost in all the web frameworks. Uh, what it allows you to do is uh, it allows developers to organize the code more effectively. Uh, now, a middleware function, uh, this sits in between the request and the response, and uh, it has access to the request object, the response object, and also the next middleware middleware function. And at any given time, uh, it can uh, send the request back or the response back to the end user. Uh, so uh, it looks something like this. Uh, so you have the HTTP request coming in. And uh, let's say this is the main task uh, that is going to fulfill your HTTP request and send the response back. Uh, but in between the the main task, uh, there you could have uh, multiple middleware functions uh, sitting here. Now, what these middleware functions can do is uh, they can do some uh, checks, they can do some logging. Uh, in this case, this is a co course middleware, uh, and uh, there is a CSRF middleware, uh, there is an authentication middleware, and at any stage, uh, this uh, middleware function uh, can send can reject the response and send the response back uh, to the end user. So this concept is. Uh, widely prevalent uh, in the uh, web frameworks. Uh, so uh, in the ABAP world, uh, you probably don't have this, or at least uh, uh, explicitly there is no middleware functions. Uh, but you can think of it as uh, uh, user exits or baddies, uh, which allow you to add some custom logic in between. Uh, it's not the same, uh, but it's uh, kind of uh, similar, right? Um, so middleware functions are pretty prevalent in our web frameworks, though. Uh, so in our case, uh, what we are going to have is uh, we are going to have the read event handler. Uh, uh, so the read uh, event uh, coming in, and uh, the SAP CAP framework, uh, this has a generic event handler that can take care of this read for you. Uh, so think of it as a managed scenario in the RAP uh, world. Uh, so in the managed scenario, the framework takes care of it for you. Similarly, in the CAP world, uh, there is a generic event handler that will take care of this uh, read for you. And it will send the response back to the end user. Uh, but what we can do, though, uh, is we can have these middleware functions functions that I just talked about. Uh, so before it reaches the generic event handler, uh, you can have a before event handler uh, that can, let's say, it can log the request uh, and then pass it on to the generic event handler. And then the response is sent to the end user. Uh, or you can have uh, uh, an event handler before it reaches the generic event handler. Uh, you can also have an event handler 
uh, that modifies the data before it gets sent to the user. So the generic event handler does the read. Uh, so the data from the read uh, can be modified uh, before it is uh, sent to the user. Uh, you can have multiple uh, uh, before handlers as well and then pass it on to the generic event handler. And uh, this is uh, going to modify the data and send it back to the end user. Or you can uh, have uh, event handlers, multiple event handlers before. Uh, you can take ownership of the uh, read event itself. Uh, so, uh, so now you have to do the read um, or whatever the event is. If it is create, then you would have to do the create. Uh, then you can also modify the data before sending the response back to the user. Uh, and in many cases, you may run into this kind of a situation where uh, you have uh, before handlers. Uh, you take ownership of the read, uh, but you do um, but you let the generic event handler do 80 or 90 percent of the work. Uh, you just do the remaining, just a little bit of it, uh, and then you can have an after handler and send the response to the end user. Uh, so in our case, our code is going to look something like this. Uh, we are going to take ownership of the read event. Uh, so this on face, uh, this uh, uh, this signifies that you're going to take ownership of the read event. Uh, and you're going to take ownership of the S4 sales orders. And then within the code, uh, you're going to pass in the API key. Uh, and uh, this is how you can do the uh, event handler. Uh, now, the key summary points is that the service uh, can uh, handle multiple uh, events. Uh, so here you can have multiple before event handlers. Uh, and not only can the service uh, handle the event, it can also emit events. Uh, we're not going to be talking about emitting events uh, in this session, uh, but uh, just uh, know that uh, you can also uh, emit events uh, from this uh, generic event handler, from the service as well. OK, so let's have a quick look at how this thing works. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how this, uh, uh, how you can um, make use of the uh, uh, middleware functions. Uh, so here, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and write the code. Uh, so we need to create a file with the same name. Uh, so you can see that I have uh, created a service.js file uh, with the same name as the CDS. Just the extension is different. Uh, the JS, of course, stands for JavaScript. Uh, so now uh, I just want to showcase uh, the middleware functions. Uh, so here I have uh, the before sales uh, order. So uh, this is uh, one of the before event handlers, uh, and I just want to show what it can do. Uh, so even before it reaches the actual read event handler, uh, what you can do is uh, you can have a event handler uh, that uh, handles the before. And you can have multiple before event handlers uh, here if you want. Now, within this, uh, in this uh, before event handler, I'm simply going to reject the, uh, the request. Uh, so if I run this, uh, so what I can do is, uh, uh, as soon as I send a request to this uh, S4 sales order headers, uh, this is uh, going to do the before event handler, and this is going to uh, reject it. Uh, so if I go into my request.http file, and if I send a request, uh, so my middleware function uh, is uh, going to catch it, and it's saying server is busy at this moment. Please try again. And uh, that is exactly what uh, we have uh, supplied here. And this is just to show uh, what the event handler can do. Uh, so the middle, so this is a middleware function that sit in, sits in front. Uh, but typically, uh, you would not do this. Uh, what you would do is uh, you would do some authentication, or you would do some uh, course, or enable course, or some kind of a function here. OK, um, so now that you've seen the middleware function in action, uh, let's go back to our slide deck. Uh, so in my slide deck, uh, I'm going to talk about promises. Uh, now, in uh, so in JavaScript, uh, if you want to do some asynchronous uh, stuff, uh, then a couple of ways in which you can do. Uh, so I'm going to show you how you can use promises. Now, promises, uh, just like the name suggests, uh, is uh, a promise. Let's say you uh, you promise to do something. Uh, let's say you want to learn JavaScript. Now, this is, of course, going to take some time to learn JavaScript. So uh, so what you can do is uh, you can come back and say, uh, once you have uh, finished learning JavaScript, 
then you can call this method called resolve, uh, which means uh, that you have completed uh, learning JavaScript. Uh, but if it uh, fails after a while, uh, then you can call the reject uh, method, and that's uh, going to say that you have failed. Uh, so how do promises work? Uh, so a quick example right here. Uh, so here we have a promise. Uh, we are creating a new promise, and it takes both the resolve and reject uh, as uh, arguments. Uh, now, again, this is going to be a long-running application. So let's say uh, you're trying to learn JavaScript. And let's say you have successfully learned JavaScript. Uh, so in this case, uh, success equals true. Uh, and then we have if it is success. So this is uh, true. So this is going to run. Uh, and then you're going to call this resolve method. And you can pass in anything here that you want. Uh, so here we are going to say, I learned JavaScript. Uh, the promise is uh, fulfilled. Uh, so if I run this uh, thing right here, here, uh, what it's going to do is uh, it's going to say, uh, I learned JavaScript uh, promises uh, fulfilled. Uh, but let's say you fail to learn JavaScript. So I say false. Uh, if I run this, uh, so this is uh, going to say that I got sidetracked, uh, promise uh, rejected. And the way you run it is uh, like this, right? Uh, so you say promise dot then. Uh, then you have uh, the whatever the message is, and this is uh, whenever it's success. Uh, so uh, anytime it is successful, uh, this is going to get run, and if it is failed, uh, this is going to get run, and that's why we got I got sidetracked, promise rejected. Now. Um, there is a much more easier way of doing this, uh, but it's good to know about promises. Uh, but uh, uh, there is also another easier way of uh, doing it, uh, which is async await. Uh, now, this is a much more syntactically shorter, much more readable way to work uh, with promises. Uh, it almost looks like synchronous code, uh, and you can use the traditional try-catch blocks if you want. Uh, so the way this async await works uh, is uh, very simple. Uh, let's say you have a long-running application, right? Uh, so, so in this case, I have a, a delay method. Uh, so this is uh, going to take some milliseconds, and it's uh, going to uh, just wait. Uh, so what I can do, let me uh, comment this line here as well. Uh, so here I'm taking ownership of these S4 sales orders, uh, but uh, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to uh, delay five seconds, and I'm going to return. Uh, now, the way this async await works is uh, you add this async uh, uh, for uh, as a decorator for the function, and then you can simply say await. Uh, uh, what this line will do is it will wait five seconds uh, before the control goes to the next line. Uh, so if I run this method, uh, so now if I run, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to wait five seconds, and then it's going to return. So I click to send request. Uh, it's waiting, waiting, waiting. And then five seconds later, uh, it gives uh, the value uh, like nothing. Uh, because um, uh, what we have done is uh, we are waiting for five seconds. Uh, so the control doesn't right away go to the next line. Uh, by putting this await, uh, the control stops there for five seconds uh, before it moves to the next line. Uh, so this is a syntax that we will use quite a bit. Uh, so we will use async here. Uh, and then you can use await here uh, for any methods that returns a promise. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, comment this line out. Uh, so now what we can do uh, is we can actually send the request uh, along with the uh, uh, API key. Now here uh, you can see uh, that we are sending the request. Uh, let me go back to my slide deck here. Uh, so we have what is called the CAP framework provides what is called uh, uh, the query language. Now, this uh, query language is uh, built using this uh, programming style called Fluent API. And what Fluent API does is it allows you to chain methods. Uh, so, And uh, the query language looks very similar to a SQL language, uh, so it's very easy to learn. Uh, you can look into the SAP CAP documentation for this uh, query language in, uh, that the CAP framework provides. Uh, but from what you can see is uh, here we are doing a select dot from uh, sales orders. Uh, so this is the entity that we are reading from. Now, this is going to return something. Now, and uh, we are 
are doing some method chaining here. So whatever this gets returned, now we are going to call this method on top of that. Uh, so now we are going to return, then we are going to retrieve just these columns. And uh, then we are going to add this method on top of this. So now this is going to limit it to just the five rows. Uh, so you can see how easy it is to read this. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a concept of programming style called Fluent API. And uh, this is uh, what the CAP framework does for this uh, query language. Uh, so if we go back here, uh, we are going to await, which means we are going to wait until this thing completes uh, before we go to the next line, uh, because we are using the async await. I showed you how in delay it was waiting five seconds before it returned. Uh, same thing here, uh, by doing await, it's going to wait until this gets read, uh, because this is a, a remote API call, because we are calling an SAP S4 HANA system. This can take one second. Sometimes if uh, the network latency is uh, too high, then it may take, or too low uh, it may take a longer time and then uh, we are using this uh, columns and we're getting all these columns and I can pass in the uh, alias name itself I don't have to pass in the actual name of the column uh, remember in the last session we used aliases uh, so here we are passing in the alias names we're going to limit it to the top 10 rows and here I'm passing in the API key now, process.env.api key, uh, in Node.js, uh, you don't have to hard code it. What you can do is you can create a file called .env, uh, put in your API key there, and then pass it in like this. Um, this way, uh, sensitive information, you don't have to hard code. Or this way, uh, let's say this thing changes quite a bit. Uh, you have one place to change it. Um, when you do deploy to the Cloud Foundry, then you can use user-provided variables. Uh, now, and then you're going to return the orders uh, along with uh, the count as well. Uh, so now if I go and run this in my request.http, uh, because we are now passing in the API key, I should be able to get the data. So now I'm able to get the uh, sales order data as well. So I'm able to get the customer data. I'm able to get the mapping customers data. I'm now able to get the sales orders data as well. Okay, uh, see you in the next session.